back to the RT clinic. Um, just want to do a little down and dirty today with BiPAP versus CPAP. And I'm really excited. You know, I'm the 600 plus subscribers. I'm going to keep the videos coming. Just keep the requests coming in. Really excited about this fall. Uh, I'm teaching a pharmacology class for the local respiratory therapy uh, program. So I'm going to put some pharmacology, respiratory pharmacology videos on. So please subscribe and like. But I'm going to give just a real quick rundown. This is one of the biggest questions that respiratory therapists uh, get from nurses and from other providers about what is the difference between BiPAP and between CPAP. So I'm a dude. I like to draw pictures and I think this is the best way to illustrate the differences between the two. So let's get started. All right, so let's start off with CPAP. So uh, CPAP, of course, CPAP, acronym for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. That's just one pressure going in, going into the airways. Uh, this pressure is measured in centimeters of water. So some kind of centimeters of water pressure is going to be going in on a scalar waveform. So we have time and pressure. This is the picture stuff I kind of like. Uh, so time here, pressure here, let's say this is 5, 10, 15, 20. When this is on a patient, let's say we're going to go a CPAP of 8. Okay, so at 8 centimeters of water pressure, you're going to see a line that comes across here about that 8 point. You're going to see small little dips in it over time. But mainly that one continuous pressure at eight centimeters of water. Uh, what these are, you'll see these little dips in that continuous pressure. That's going to be a patient starting a breath. A lot of CPAP machines can actually increase the amount of flow that comes in. So how is the pressure really delivered? Is uh, flow is delivered and we measure pressure. So we're going to uh, deliver a certain amount of flow and then measure the pressure coming back and that's the pressure readout you're going to have here. So what's a normal setting for CPAP? Well, for one, uh, let's talk about the diseases that you usually treat with it. Number one is OSA, obstructive sleep apnea. So when you go into a specific um, stage of sleep, you're going to lose tone of your airway. This happens with some, some people. And um, what we have to do is give this continuous pressure to splint the airway open throughout all um, stages of sleep. So you have to have a sleep study. So a sleep study, they put you in. They, they lay you down, it's a really poor picture, but they lay you down, they put some monitors on you, they put an EEG on your head, all that stuff going back. They put a little monitor by your nose that monitors flow. They put a monitor on your chest that monitors chest movement, and they tell you to go to sleep, and it's really hard to do, but when you go to sleep, what they're gonna measure is flow coming in here and is your chest moving. So obstructive sleep apnea is, is when you're breathing normally, you have flow through you, and all of a sudden you continue to breathe here at your chest, your chest movement, and the flow stops right here at the nose. So you lose the flow, so there's obstruction somewhere. Obstructive sleep apnea, OSA, that's the biggest one. So uh, we add flow, they may wake you up, put you on a CPAP, add flow in, and that's gonna splint your airway open. So everybody's setting's a little bit different. Now, a lot of times if you lose weight, your settings may go down, or you may not need CPAP, CPAP anymore. Um, but the main thing that CPAP is used for is, ox is oxygenation or splinting the airway. So let's talk about the oxygenation portion of it. So CPAP um, for oxygenation uh, could use this on maybe an asthmatic comes into ER, somebody maybe in an acute CHF, congestive heart failure. Uh, CPAP works really well for that. I draw my really poor representation of alveoli here. So let's say you have something in your airways or you have collapsed alveoli, atelectasis, collapse. So, um, or in this case, let's say we have some CHF, so we have some fluid coming over for increased oncotic pressure, push fluid over into the alveoli. So this is all area where you, you should, should be oxygenating, pushing oxygen across to your, to your bloodstream. So in the case of CPAP, when we increase that pressure coming down into these areas, that aid of CPAP, let's say in this case, is actually going to help offset that oncotic pressure. So the pressure inside the airways now is higher than what's pushing from the vessels. 
It's going to push that fluid back into the system and then you get rid of it with diuretics and whatnot. So that's all good stuff. And then in the case of atelectasis and ammonia, the pressure comes in and boom, opens up some of these alveoli so you can start oxygenating with them again. So CPAP, one pressure. In this case, I used eight, but I mean, I've seen it up to 20, 24 on some people. And it's not just like it's a 300 pound guy that needs 24. I've seen frail, older women that just, they need a higher amount. So you have to have a sleep study to know exactly what your pressure is. If you're using less than a pressure, a pressure that's less than what keeps your airway open, you might as well not use it at all. But it's really good for OSA. So um, that's CPAP, kind of in a nutshell. So oxygenation, splint in the airway, that's what it can be used for. Maybe in a CHF exacerbation without a ventilatory component, it works really well, or open alveoli for just straight oxygenation. So the next one that's going to BiPAP. BiPAP's the one you're gonna see way more often because it actually has two pressures involved in it. And it kind of is the, the default these days. A lot of our machines just, <clears throat> they put somebody in BiPAP before they even do CPAP. So BiPAP looks a little bit like this. So that says Bi for two, positive airway pressure. So we have two positive airway pressures. This is actually a brand name. Um, you'll also hear it called NIPPV, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Use that acronym if you want to try to confuse somebody um, or sound really smart, which is like really half of medicine sounding smart. So NIPPV, same thing as BiPAP, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So two pressures, you have these two pressures. One's called an IPAP. And don't you love acronyms? So IPAP is inspiratory. PAP, positive airway pressure, and this is expiratory, positive airway pressure. Sometimes people will think, well, isn't that kind of like PEEP, Jimmy? Well, kind of is, but it, PEEP is positive into expiratory pressure. This is a continuous pressure, uh, positive expiratory pressure. So it's a little bit different. PEEP we usually think of when we think of a mechanical ventilator and be your mechanical ventilation. So we got IPAP, we got EPAP, or EPAP and IPAP. So we set two settings on this one. This is how it's gonna function. BiPAP with those two pressures is going to do two things. It's going to oxygenate and it's going to ventilate. So let's set, let's set an IPAP of 12 and let's set an EPAP of 6. So it may look a little bit like this when I go to the, the guy version where I'm going to draw a picture here. So we're running at 6 right here. We'll see a trigger in the breath that will go up and come back down. So you notice the fluctuation from baseline that you're going to see with BiPAP. So let's say this is the 12 up here, this is the 6 right here. The little dip, patient actuated breath. That's the great thing about BiPAP because it is going to, the best definition that I like to give is it augments a person's spontaneous breath. So this is not the type of device you want to do if somebody is apneic. You don't put them on a BiPAP. Uh, because they really need to start their own breath and this is going to help them get their breath in or augment their, their own spontaneous tidal volume. So patient starts a breath, it's going to give them a higher amount of pressure and then come back down, starts a breath. And let's say this patient goes on here for a while and doesn't breathe. Bi the BiPAP settings have what's called a backup rate on it. So let's say our rate set at 10. So a rate set at 10, so if that's a breath every six seconds, Last time I checked, so let's say it took longer than six seconds, this machine will cycle on its own. You notice there's no little uh, dip right here for the actuated breath, so if that's six seconds, if we have a, a backup rate of 10, it's gonna trigger on its own. Well, that's fine, and that's, that's good, but you can't do this for real long because you really need the mechanical movement of the body starting to take the breath to get the air in. You can blast somebody over and over with these pressure, but when you're doing it non-invasively, it doesn't work like a mechanical ventilator. So you really need to take their own breath. If they are having a lot of these where they're having long periods of apnea, they might need an tracheal tube and a mechanical vent to get that fixed. But just so you know, they do have the backup rate on it. Sometimes when you hit the backup rate, it will alarm, you know, there'll be like a little alarm go off. It'll beep a couple times just to say, hey, by the way, 
this patient's not breathing at least 10 times a minute, I'm gonna have to breathe for it on, on uh, through the machine. So anyway, what BiPAP does, the best way to think of it, the best way that I always think, think of it, is this area right here, that's our area of oxygenation. These peaks are, is our area of ventilation. When I say ventilation, I always say synonymous with CO2, so getting CO2 out. So BiPAP does two big things. Oxygenates and gets and ventilates as oxygen gets rid of CO2. So two different things, which is really great. So if I do somebody's blood gas, and this is just kind of next level stuff, but let's say I've run on a BiPAP for, for an hour and I have a blood gas and I'll just do a real quick one. So in this case, uh, 727, 65 CO2, 90 PO2, and 24 bicarb. So this is uh, uncompensated respiratory acidosis. So there are this like this on a BiPAP, then I need to do a couple different things. I want to fix CO2, but our oxygenation is not bad. And let's say they're on a 30% FiO2 in this case. So we're not going to mess with the oxygen, but we want to ventilate them more. The one thing that the RTs will commonly do, or our physicians could also order this, is they're gonna increase this 12. So let's take this 12 now and bump the 12 up to, let's say 15. So instead of going to 12, it's gonna go up to 15 each time. You notice the higher peaks, more area in these peaks, which means you're gonna get rid of more CO2 each time, which is what we wanna do in this case, because they're hypoventilated. And that's basic management of a BiPAP. Um, there's other things that we can change if oxygenation and ventilation um, are both bad. We might move both numbers up. We might actually split the di split the amount between these two, but that's a little more complicated for a different day. But just know increasing that IPAP is going to help improve ventilation. So that's the down and dirty BiPAP versus CPAP. I'll try to keep this short for everybody. Any comments, please comment in. Uh, tell your friends, like, subscribe. Give me some topics to go over I would love to and I'm really excited about um, everybody viewing the videos so thanks a lot have a good day